Make sure to like, follow, and subscribe to our podcast. Listen, do what you gotta do to keep us around, okay? This episode of Off the Cuff is brought to you by Weaver Simmons LLP, Northern Ontario's largest full-service law firm with over 30 lawyers and 60 support staff. For over 90 years, the law firm of Weaver Simmons has proudly served the interests of Northern Ontario residents and has built its reputation based on exceptional services to its clients. For more information about the firm, please visit www.weaversimmons.com. The link is provided in the description below. Welcome to uh, the addendum to episode four. I'm Deeran Chohan. And as you can notice, I don't have my co-host sitting beside me today, which is a bit unfortunate. However, uh, we thought that it's been a while since uh, we've uh, released any content and I wanted to give you guys an update uh, as to where we're at. So last time we talked about uh, some cases uh, that we saw in the, in the media, the boats, the tree houses, uh, the pirate ships, the fences. And our next episode uh, we're working on right now, and we're very excited to share that with you. Um, but it's just taking a little bit longer because the cases are pretty in-depth, and we want to make sure we do a good job of that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we know that our listeners and you guys really enjoy the, the legal content, and so we're working hard to make that uh, possible to share with you. Today... Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, life as a lawyer and uh, what TV law looks like versus what we deal with in real life. And uh, we've received a lot of questions and we thought, you know, hey, why not, you know, give just a little update as to what we do here versus what you see on TV and, and thought that that would be helpful for people to hear. So the first thing that, uh, from my perspective that I see on TV when I watch legal shows, and of course I watch legal shows as well, and I always get a kick out of how fast things go to trial or they're in hearings. You know, you'll watch a TV show and they'll uh, arrest a guy, and, you know, within 20 minutes of the episode, they're already, they've got all their evidence, they're at a trial, and and (laughs) then by the end of the 40-minute episode, it's done. And there's a verdict and a jury has heard all the evidence and it's all just magic. But in real life, uh, it doesn't go like that at all. For example, I've had a case where uh, we tried to start a trial, a jury trial in 2018. You know, it's a historical case, probably two or three years old, maybe even four years old at that time. And now we're in 2022. We've had to reschedule that jury trial uh, it was scheduled to start this February and now because of COVID it was canceled and we've been advised that there's no jury trials available until 2023. So for, for a TV case to go to trial within f- 20 minutes versus our trial, which has yet to be heard and we're probably seven years out now. And so that's, I think one of the common misconceptions that people have uh, with TV law is that how, how quickly things go to trial. And we see that a lot in our practice because, you know, our clients will come to us and say, I want this over with. I want this over with now. I want it done. And a lot of a lawyer's job is client management and managing your client's expectations. And so when I have to tell somebody who's in a heated family law dispute or a heated litigation dispute with somebody that, you know, it could be two years before we finalize your case or even get to the point where a hearing is scheduled or coming, you know, that's a big shock because most people's access to the law is through television. And when they try to extrapolate that experience from television into real life, it's, it's quite an awakening for them. And that's a lot of what we have to do as a lawyer. And that, that often comes with long conversations, your tempering expectations, your managing emotions. And the reality is, and I take it back to our very first episode where I said, the best outcome is where everyone's unhappy. It's true. You know, that usually when you come to a resolution, the reason you come to a resolution is not because you want to, it's more because 
from a cost perspective and from a, uh, you know, emotional perspective and from a time perspective, a resolution makes more sense than waiting four years to go to trial on something where you're leaving your fate in the hands of a judge and you don't necessarily know, know what the outcome is going to be. And as a lawyer, we can't guarantee you with the outcomes. I think that's another misconception that people have with, uh, with lawyers is that we can guarantee you an outcome and fix the problem and it, you know, it will all work out in the end. Well, I think another misconception that has to be shattered is that we're not magicians. You know, if you come to us and your problem is not fixable, part of our job is to tell you that it's not fixable. So that makes our job difficult, but also it, it's rewarding because I think that that's what separates who somebody who is a good lawyer versus somebody who is um, in it just for the sake of, you know, earning a paycheck or doing the job uh, and not necessarily servicing their clients to the best of their abilities. I think that what, what makes somebody a good lawyer will be that person who is able to tell their client when they are not in a good position and when they encourage those clients to resolve um, and encourage those clients to step back and take a look at their unreasonableness in their positions, which leads into the next episode actually a little bit because you know the two cases that we're looking at or will be looking at in that in that episode really do talk about the unreasonable neighbor which ties back into our last episode and how you know perhaps with encouragement uh, to resolve or you know advice on their positions, maybe the outcome of those cases could have changed. And you'll see that in the next episode. And it's, it's very intriguing and very interesting and cool to, to evaluate and look at and to see how far people can go. And our job is to make sure that if those people are taking those positions, that they are very well aware of the risks of taking those positions and managing that effectively and explaining that when the outcome doesn't go their way, there was nothing the lawyer could have done other than review all of the advice given to that point and say, you know, effectively, I told you so. That's, I, you know, one of the larger misconceptions, I think, uh, that people have of the law. The other, um, maybe not misconception, but procedurally, uh, you oftentimes on TV will see people walking around the courtroom and lawyers pacing in front of a jury and lawyers pacing in front of a witness and uh, all of that is just theatrics really for TV. In Canada and especially in Canadian courts, as a lawyer, you don't move. Um, you are There's a counsel table, you sit at the counsel table and you, uh, when you're speaking, you stand up. When you're addressing the jury, you actually address the jury from, you either can go to a podium or you stand at the counsel table to address the jury. You don't ever pace in front of the jury in, in Canadian courts. Um, there are certain circumstances where maybe it, it is efficient or effective or it happens to be that your podium is very close to the jury. Uh, it just depends on the configuration of the courtroom. But there's not a lot of theatrics in court. So when you actually go watch a, a Canadian trial or a Canadian court, the lawyers are, are not doing that high drama, high theatrics, you know, yelling at the jury, yelling at the witness. That doesn't really happen in court. Um, it's a very respectful atmosphere, especially there's a lot of respect between lawyers. There's a lot of respect given to the court. There's a lot of respect given to the jurors and, and to the witnesses um, because there are are rules against berating a witness. You're not allowed to yell at witnesses and be aggressive with your with the witness, uh, even if the witness is uh, opposite your position. And so the biggest misconception I think that people have with respect to that is the decorum of the court because it's portrayed a lot differently on TV. And I can't speak to, of course, what happens in American courtrooms and a lot of the TV that we watch is American-based. But in Canada, when you're when you're trying to, you know, plan to go to court and you're getting ready and you're getting dressed, and and I'll actually touch on that a little bit um, in a second. But you should really 
understand that being in a courtroom is a very respectful atmosphere and you respect the, everyone there, including, you know, the opposite party to the litigation. So it's not acceptable for you to sit in the courtroom and yell across the courtroom at the other party just because you're in litigation with them. And, you know, sometimes you'll see that on TV and it's just not, uh, it's not acceptable. The last thing I'll touch on is attire. And especially now uh, with Zoom court, and I'm sure, you know, our listeners and our viewers are dealing with virtual court now. And I will say my biggest pet peeve with virtual court is seeing somebody log into Zoom court in their pajamas sitting on a couch. Drives me nuts. Um, You know, I still am fully dressed. I'm either in a suit or in my robes, and depending on the level of court. But I see people logging in on Zoom, on their phones, sitting in their cars, and, you know, they've got all their full winter gear on. I've seen people with a balaclava on in court. And I think that if I were to say with this pandemic and all this virtual court, that's probably my biggest pet peeve right now is that attire and decorum and respect for the court process is, is being lost with virtual court. And if you're listening to this and if you're watching, please, if you find yourself in court, dress appropriately, you know, sit at your kitchen table Put a, you know, put a blouse on or put a collared shirt on, you know, do your hair, you know, don't have your dog running through the background barking while you're addressing the court, you know, take appropriate steps as if you were in court, you wouldn't bring your dog to the courtroom. So put your dog in a different place or, you know, if you've got children running around the house and sometimes you can't avoid it, of course, that's, that's fine. But again, you wouldn't bring your children to court, so perhaps your court appearance should be treated as important as you coming to court in person, and you should find some place to put them, uh, either by way of a babysitter or have somebody take, take, uh, take care of them while you're in court, or even just lock yourself in a different room for the half hour that you're addressing the court. I think that those tips, uh, if you follow those, you will be respected by the court, and if you show respect for the court, the court and its its stakeholders will show respect to you. And I think I can leave you with that because to me, that's the most important thing. Um, you know, stay tuned for our next episode. We're very excited uh, to share that with you. Uh, that should be releasing very soon, we hope. And uh, take care. Again, we'll say Happy New Year and uh, tune in next time. Make sure to like, follow, and subscribe to our podcast. Listen, do what you got to do to keep us around, okay?